Good evening. Welcome and thank you for joining us for Conservation Conversations presented by the Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife Resources. My name is Kevin Kelly and I'm joined again tonight by co-host Gabe Jenkins. Gabe, how are you? Man, good I'm to good, see you Kevin. again. Yep, you too. Glad to be here tonight. Looking forward to our conversations today. Absolutely. I'm excited. I'm really excited about tonight's topic. Um, carrying the, the theme of restoration uh, forward from our premiere installment uh, a couple weeks ago. Tonight's uh, going to be all about Bob White quail restoration efforts in Kentucky. Gabe, who do we have joining us tonight? So we got a great lineup tonight. Um, we're going to feature our wildlife division and wildlife division staff. Um, we have three members that have a variety of expertise and background, all related to quail uh, in some form or fashion, whether it's quail biology, quail research, and quail habitat. Um, so our first guest tonight will be Ben Robinson. Ben is the Assistant Director of the Wildlife Division and co-author of the Road to Recovery Blueprint for Restoring the Northern Bob White Quail in Kentucky. Ben, nice to have you today. Thank you, thank you. Looking forward to it. Okay. And also joining tonight, we will have Cody Roden. Cody? Cody is our Acting Small Game Program Coordinator. And uh, if you follow the Kentucky Field podcast, you may have heard Cody. He's been on there a lot talking about quail and all the cool things that he does in his, his position. So, Cody, welcome tonight. Thanks so much, Gabe. Really looking forward to this conversation. Good, good. And then lastly, um, Jacob Stewart. Um, Jacob is, is new in his new role now. He is the private lands coordinator with the department. Uh, you may recall seeing Jacob on a, more, um, a recent episode of Kentucky Field where we were conducting a prescribed fire episode. So Jacob's got a lot of expertise in habitat, habitat management. So Jacob, thank you and welcome to tonight's show. Be here, looking forward to it. Awesome. Gentlemen, thanks for tonight. I'll go ahead and preface that. You're gonna hear me say thank you for your expertise. Thank you for what you do for this department, for all the sportsmen and women in this state and all the things that, uh, that you provide in small game and quail. So let's go ahead and jump right in. So also remember, we will be taking questions tonight. So please, if you're following along, type those questions into the chat function in YouTube, and then we'll try to address those um, at the very end. So Ben, let's go ahead and uh, kick, kick things off for us. Tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Yeah, sounds good, Gabe. Well, I'm a, about a 16 year veteran of the agency. And uh, currently I serve in the role of assistant director of the wildlife division been doing that for about five years now, but prior to that, um, I spent about 10 years as the state's small game biologist, and really my primary duties there were Bob White quail. That's where I spent a lot of time. We covered other species as well, but, um, you know, all small game for that matter, but uh, quail restoration was really where I spent a whole lot of my time, and I'm real excited to get to talk about it again tonight. Cool, cool. Well, we were, we were thinking about starting just kind of with the basics. You know, um, Bob White Quail, tell us a little bit about this species. You know, uh, how do they get their name? How do you distinguish, you know, male from female, that type of thing? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Kevin. You know, we, I'm sure there's folks tuning in that are veteran quail hunters, have lots of experience. So stick with us. You know, we're not going to bore you to death. We'll get to the, <laughs> the good stuff later. But we also realize we probably got some folks that maybe have never seen a quail before. So, uh, we want to make sure that every that we cover all of our bases and and do a little bit of an intro. But so Bob White quail, really, they're the northern Bob White is what they're called. Um, but most folks know them as the Bob White quail. And Gabe, if you can cue up that whistle, if it'll play, um, you know they get their name from the sound that they make when they whistle. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but it's basically the Bob White whistle. So a lot of folks have probably never, maybe not got to see a quail. You know, they spend most of their time on the ground. Uh, they're not out flying around in trees and coming to your bird feeder very often. You know, they spend a lot of time on the ground, but most people are pretty familiar with that Bob White whistle. That's, it's a, I like to say a famous sound in the countryside. You know, if you, if you spend much time outdoors in the country, you, you know what a quail is. So Ben, uh, you know, on that whistle, um, is that something they do all the time or is that just a mating call or, you know, what, when would a, somebody hear that sound or when it would be familiar to hear, hear the quail whistle? Yeah, good question, Gabe. You know, you can hear that sound all the time, but you're really going to hear it fire up during the breeding season. That's the male Bob White making that sound and he's trying to attract 
a mate. So in Kentucky, probably around April is when when you're going to start to hear that, but it's going to go all throughout the summer months um, with those males really looking for mates. Okay. Um, you know, my white quail, they're not only native to Kentucky, they're found in around 25 different states. And unfortunately, um, as in Kentucky, uh, the populations are declining pretty much across their entire range. And Gabe's flashed a range map up here. And, and this is, this is more of a historical map. This bleeds over into some states, especially out west, where really we don't have bob white quail anymore. Um, the range is kind of condensed. So now you're looking at Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas is kind of your western most portion of the range. Um, really, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, that's that's getting pretty far north for quail these days. Uh, so they're still found, though you know, in, in pretty good densities, especially when you get over to uh, kind of the Western states, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, still good numbers over there. All right. So you kind of given us a name. Let's, let's talk species ID. You know, what do they look the same? Tell me about how you can distinguish a male from a female or if you even can. Yeah, you can, in this bird, you can, you know, some, some animals you cannot, but, um, the male Bob White is pretty distinguishable um, with his white facial markings. Um, the female, she's going to have more of the brown, you know, buffy coloring around her face, really more for camouflage. Um, and but um, if you look at their bodies, you really can't tell much difference. Their their feathers on their bodies look pretty similar. All right, so I think you've given us a pretty good intro to quail. Um, so. Let's talk, let's bring it back home to Kentucky. You know, tell us about Kentucky. Let's let's think about, you know, in the very early days of history where we had them, what we know about them. Give me a give me a good uh, presentation of the past in, in Kentucky yeah. quail. Yeah, absolutely. You know, as we go through this tonight with with Cody and Jacob, we've kind of talked about breaking it up into more of the the past, the present, and the future of quail in Kentucky. And um so I'm going to kick you off with the past, and when I say past, I mean we're talking all the way back to 1900. You know, we're gonna we're gonna throw it way back, and and then we'll try to give a little bit of history and bring it back into the 1980s, and then I'm gonna hand it hand it over to Cody, and he can take it from there on what we're doing currently. But as far as the past goes, um, quail back in you know the early 1900s, really up until the 1950s, 60s, even 70s. Quail were king. You know, quail is known as the gentleman's game bird. We didn't have, you know, our populations of deer and turkey like we have now. Um, we had very strong, robust populations of quail, and we had a lot of people out hunting them. And um, so, yeah, very, uh, very prolific bird during that time period. Um, yeah, you gave flashed up a picture of, of some vintage quail hunters we'll call them this is probably from you know the early 1900s and uh and we're going to get into some discussions about why quail are declining later um, believe it or not you wouldn't believe it from this picture but uh it's not a hunting issue um maybe back in the 1900s it was when you see pictures like this maybe they were over harvesting a little bit but but in modern times that's not the issue um, but you know moving forward when you get into say the 19, early 1920s, um, quail populations were good. But when I look at historical records, I see that around, I think it was around 1919, 1920, we had a really, really severe winter here around Kentucky and our numbers started to plummet. And, uh, and winters can do that to quail if you get strong enough, hard enough winters and you don't have you know proper cover and whatnot. Um, so at that time, the sportsmen, you know, they were, really kind of up in arms like what are we going to do this is our right this is our bread and butter and uh and they're starting to go down so at the time um we didn't have the kentucky department of fish and wildlife we had the kentucky game and fish commission i believe is what they were known as and um they came up with an idea and they said well maybe we can find some birds somewhere else from another state another country in this situation and uh, and bring them in here and and 
to be fair to them, you know, there was very little research or anything done on quail. I mean, this was very novel to even think about bringing birds in from somewhere else. Um, so they did, they worked out a deal. Uh, I think it was with Mexico and they, mm-hmm. they brought in or attempted to bring in Mexican quail. And from what I read, um, uh, I think those birds came in on train cars and they didn't come in in very good condition. You know, I think a lot of them, I'm not even sure they survived the transport. Um, but when they did arrive, they were in poor condition. And, you know, long story short, that was kind of a failure. Um, so. And that, you know, that was pretty common in the thirties too. And just other species. I know that in the Western States, they were moving deer and elk and, and moose by train and all over trying to, Reestablish, reestablishing population. So, you know, it makes sense that we uh, were trying to get quail from other sources in the state. You know, we have a long tradition as an agency doing things like that. So, absolutely. And, you know, for some species, I mean, you, you look at deer and turkey and, and elk and a lot of our successes there. I mean, that works. It works right. to be able to move animals around and, and release them. But, and we'll talk more about that later, but with quail, unfortunately, it's not that easy. I wish it was because we would be in a lot better shape than we are. But again, at the time, this was kind of trial and error. It hadn't been done. There hadn't, there was no research on it. So that being said, fast forward to the 1930s and they said, well, let's try it again, but this time let's go bigger. So they brought in a hundred thousand Mexican quail this time and, uh, and released those all around the state. And once again, uh, it was pretty much a failed effort. I think I'd say some birds hung on for a little while, but they ultimately blinked out. And uh, so I think they went back to the drawing board and, and kind of tabled that whole concept for almost a decade. And um, the next big move, and, and I think Kevin can talk a little bit more about this, was, you know, the purchase of the current property that were on the, you know, the game farm here in Frankfurt. Yeah, I mean, you know, here, this is where the headquarters are of Fish and Wildlife these days. And, you know, back in 1945, it was a, it was a farm uh, that, uh, you know, the Division of Game and Fish had, had just been, just become a separate state agency. And in 45, the, the division purchases this farm uh, for a whopping grand total of $12,575. Uh, fun fact at that time uh, that there were, uh, the deer population in the state of Kentucky was less than a thousand. Wow. But uh, if you come out here, um, you know, these days you still see remnant buildings uh, from the from the quail uh, operation uh, that took place. And I know, Ben, you're going to cover this here coming up shortly. But uh, yeah, you can still uh, yeah. you know, feel like you're part of history. Absolutely. And I, I still... You know, I know folks that, that still refer to this place as the game farm. And for those of us who work here now in Frankfurt, we we mostly call it the headquarters. But but it's uh, a lot of folks still call it, you know, the game farm. And and you're right. One of our quail brood houses is now serves as our classroom building and our Kentucky field studio. So yeah. uh, hopefully that was cleaned real well before they moved everybody <laughs> right. in. But, uh, but I'll, I'll add, you know, around this time in the mid 40s, that's when you when when it became the division of game of fish is when the focus on science based management really took hold. And, you know, that's why they were trying this, you know, what Ben is about ready to talk about, you know, this was, I'm assuming cutting edge at the time, you know, trying to to do this massive effort to bolster the population of quail in Kentucky. Absolutely. I mean, cutting edge is probably the best way to describe it for the 1940s. And, mm-hmm. you know, they, they tried already the Mexican quail, but they had what was what seemed like a pretty good idea once the game farm started up. And, and that was actually taking some native quail stock and raising them, you know, farming them, farming game. And um, so their idea was was to raise wild quail and release them across the state. And this started again, you know, 19, mid 1940s, uh, fast forward to the 1950s and they decided, well, our quail program seems to be going pretty good. You know, we're having a lot of luck brooding out these birds. Let's try pheasants too, see if we can get them to take. And, uh, you know, pheasants in Kentucky, yeah, uh, they, they've never really done that well. And, uh, but again, this was, it was a novel approach and, uh, they raised several different, um, varieties of pheasants here and 
from what I've read, I think that was about a three to five year research project and just a few release sites, a few thousand birds around the state. Uh, I think one site was maybe in kind of the Nelson County, Boston area and, and uh, another maybe down around Campbellsville, if I'm not mistaken. But uh, again, much like the Mexican quail efforts, you know, they, they found out that these birds just weren't doing well. Um, a lot of predators getting after them, a lot of disease, things like that. So, and a lot of the, well. correct me if I'm wrong, some of the, some of the pheasant species were, you know, of, of Asian origin, correct? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, most of them were. And uh, so again, uh, a good attempt uh, and, and I give them a big attaboy for trying, but it, it unfortunately didn't work, but the quail program persisted and uh, you know, that, that carried on actually all the way up into the late 1980s. And I think it was 1989 when that program finally ended. And, you know, I don't, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of quail later, um, we finally realized, Hey, this just, it isn't working. And at this time, the research university research state agency research was really starting to catch up as well. And it was gaining traction. And, uh, and, and we started learning a lot and realized, hey, I, these birds are just not doing well. They're not surviving good. They're not reproducing in the wild like we had thought that they would. Um, so that program was then abandoned. And the, the main thing really through this whole process that was overlooked, and, and this is what we're going to really focus on as we move forward with our present and our future section, was, was habitat. And... A lot of folks are probably like, well, I hear that word a lot, but what is habitat? And in its simplest form, I mean, habitat is a place to live. You've got to have all of the proper requirements and that's food, cover, and water. Um, however, habitat looks different for every species. So you take deer and turkey are so successful because they can live just about anywhere. I mean, we see deer in neighborhoods. We see deer practically in parking lots. You know, they don't require very specific needs, but quail unfortunately do. And, um, and that was kind of the thing that was overlooked. Um, and, and when I say overlooked, I don't want to confuse that with, well, if we have good habitat, now we can release birds and we'll be fine. Unfortunately, it's not that simple. You know, uh, even when you have good habitat, releasing pen raised birds um, has been proven not to work, but improving habitat, um, we're seeing that it really can benefit the wild birds that are still out on the landscape. Ben, I'd like to back up just a little bit. You know, we kind of talked about quail and, you know, the, the game farm and us, and us raising them here. Do we have any historical counts or any idea on how many birds we raised or propagated and released? Uh, some, some numbers on that. I've seen numbers cresting a million on that game. And, uh, wow. but you think we did it for, you know, 40 to 50 years. It's incredible. And uh, yeah, it's incredible. And uh, so, you know, if it was going to be successful after you dump a million plus birds on the landscape, you think they would have taken and started to reproduce, but unfortunately they did not. And, if, and I know in my preparation, we were reading that at one point that the game farm was the largest quail breeding facility in the country. So meaning that we had, had a lot of quail that we were trying so all the effort that we were trying at the time to raise quail to put them all across the state uh the very best very best job that we knew at that time absolutely okay so i think we've kind of covered a little bit of the past and the and kind of where we were as far as you know not a lot of we had quail we tried a lot of different things whether we were bringing in pheasants or different species, and then we tried raising them. And then we really move into about the 1980s, 1990s, and you kind of set us up nicely on habitat. Um, is that kind of where we want to move into habitat and where the agency starts to realign its focus on where we want to go in small game? Absolutely. I think it's a good transition. And, and you know, Cody's really going to start driving home the point of habitat and, and especially the the incremental changes over time. I know that's what Cody really wants to talk about. And uh, because quail, as we've seen in our surveys, this didn't happen overnight. I mean, this was a long-term decline starting back in the twenties and thirties and just incrementally over time with slight, you know, ever so slight changes uh, in habitat every decade. 
uh, that's kind of how we've gotten to where we're at. But with that, I'm going to turn it over to Cody and let him talk a little bit more about the specifics. And as Cody, as Cody joins us here, you know, just a quick reminder that, um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll be answering questions, uh, you know, tonight. So go ahead and uh, leave those in the, in the box over here on YouTube and uh, we'll get to those as, as we can. But uh, Cody, take it away. Thanks, Kevin and Gabe, and uh, thanks to Ben for that great um, introduction about what has happened in the past. And he left off with a great point. Um, one thing that I hope that we can remember moving forward into the present is that we released a whole bunch of birds out on the landscape through time, you know, up into the late 80s. Um, and just keep that in the back of your mind as we work through some of these um, PowerPoint slides I'm going to show you here. And so for my talk, I'm gonna to try to kind of paint a picture about what has changed in the last 30 or 40 years in Kentucky. And so my motivations for this, are thinking about this when I was getting this presentation together was a lot of my conversations that I have with landowners and sports people in the Commonwealth and how sometimes they mention, you know, where have all the quail gone? You know, my back 40 hasn't changed that much since I've started living here and I've lived here for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years. And so I'm going to try to paint us a picture as we're moving through these slides about how the landscape has actually changed. Again, as Ben mentioned, incre incrementally through time, which is very hard to perceive, especially when we're living on the landscape. And so here, and I apologize beforehand, I will be showing a lot of graphs and stuff. Um, I will say, you know, for anything that I show um, in this presentation, you know, just kind of pay attention to the trends, the data within the graph. We don't really have to worry about what's on the X and Y axis right now. We're just going to be looking at, you know, kind of the trends of these data. And so here we're showing the trends of six bird species in Kentucky from 1966 to 2015. And the reason why we're showing bird species is because birds have done a really good job through time figuring out um, what habitats to live in. So remember habitat was a home for an animal. And so birds are a group of animals that have become really good at finding their niche or their little small habitat area that they can live in. So one thing I think about all the time is a great blue heron versus a hawk versus an owl, you know, each one of those three animals has figured out a corner of the world that they can make their own and live in. These six species here are grassland songbirds. So these birds live in grass and shrublands across the Eastern United States and as well as in Kentucky. And so these data are showing that all of these grassland songbirds are declining, right? So we can see that as we move from the left to the right um, of our graphs here, all of these grassland songbirds have declined since 1966. And I will note that some of these, such as this one right here, the Eastern Meadowlark, some of these birds were really quite common um, back in the early 60s uh, when these points were very first uh, being sampled. And so we have this group of birds that represents this habitat or this home for animals. And this group of birds, again, lives in grasslands and they are declining. And so now I'm showing you some data from our rural mail carrier survey. And so this survey is a survey in which rural mail carriers fill out the number of rabbits and quail that they observe in their rural mail routes in the last full week of July in the summer. And so as you can see, we're looking down here at the year. So this began in 1960 and it runs today. It runs currently. Um, and as you can see, as we move from 1960 all the way to 2020, the number of quail has precipitously declined through that time. And it's kind of interesting on these graphs, we can even see some really bad weather events that Ben briefly touched on mm -hmm. here in 1977, 1978. Some of our viewers might actually remember those winters. Um, they were really bad and they, they really knocked the statewide quail population in the head and knocked them back. Cody, let me, I'd like to just kind of point this out and, and talk about this just a little. This is an awesome graph to talk about, you know, to just point out our partners. Uh, you know, we as an agency, 
we have a lot of folks that do research and do work, but we also collaborate with with private NGOs or individuals. I mean, right here is a perfect example that we've been using the post office of all people to help us in data management and collecting data for us to help manage the species. I mean, 1960, you know, almost 60 years now, we've been using the post office to collect this data. And it's a perfect example of how we collaborate, how we work with people to get what we need. And it's, it's a fantastic data source. It's a, it's a brilliant idea. I, yes. mean, I don't know who came up with it, but you think of somebody who's going to travel every square inch of every square mile, uh, you know, in a, in a county, um, it's your mail carrier. It's, uh, it's fascinating. Very stuff. cool. Yeah. Yeah. Good points, Kevin and Gabe. And this is almost a thousand individuals through time every year, almost a thousand wow. real mail carriers fill in our survey cards and send them in. And so this really gives us kind of puts our finger on the pulse of the quilt population through time in the Commonwealth. And so, yeah, you're right. It's a very cool data set and one that we draw on quite a bit, um, even within the wildlife division to make decisions on, you know, do we need to be having a look at these things? Um, how is the statewide population? Is it up or down this year? We even make some predictions on the hunting season and things along those lines. So we really utilize these data and you're right. It's very important to point out our partners. Real quickly, I'll go back. Gabe, Gabe uh, you mentioned something just a few minutes ago, an NGO. For those, uh, for those watching yeah. tonight, what is an NGO? So, uh, so non-government organization is, I guess, the acronym that we like to use. So those are people that we partner with, organizations that we partner with to help us in the conservation of the species. So you're familiar with, and our viewers, I'm sure, are familiar with these organizations, organizations such as Ducks Unlimited or Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or um, Quail Unlimited. There's different groups out there that, that have kind of a species focus that, that work to help uh, foster that relationship and research and funding to be a partner with us. And uh, Cody, you might talk about some of the other NGOs that you work with that are specific to quail and organizations that you're aware of. Yeah, definitely. And I appreciate you mentioning that. And I will even mention um, a specific NGO that we've worked with throughout our um, last uh, 10 to 15 years in Kentucky, um, the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. And I'll definitely touch on them more. Um, I don't know if you mentioned Quail Forever, but Quail and Pheasant Forever are, have been a great partner for us here in Kentucky. Um, and yeah, so partners are huge for us. And as we move into the 21st century, which we'll talk about more even in our future slides, you know, partnerships are going to really be core to what we do moving into the future. All right, excellent. So let's kind of get back and let's talk habitat some more. You know, you were kind of getting us squared up on a current status and uh, get back on track here, Cody. Thanks, Gabe. So yeah, what I'm trying to show here is the quail population in Kentucky and again throughout most of its range is declining in the states in which it currently exists today. And so starting probably in the late 90s, or early 2000s, you know, Sports people knew this way back, okay? They knew it in 1977 after the bad winters, you know, and, and researchers and biologists started to get really interested in this in the 1990s. And naturally, we would ask the question, you know, why are these grassland songbirds declining? Why are quail declining? And so we have some ideas about why that is. So here I'm showing us a map of what we think Kentucky looked like prior to European settlement. So this map depicts what was going on before Europeans got to the state. And so as we know very well, before Europeans got to the state, Native Americans were in Kentucky and li very likely altering the landscape along with um, large herbivores, things like buffalo and elk and things along those lines. And so in this map, um, I'd like you to pay attention to the beige areas and the light green areas. Both of those, colors represent open grasslands in Kentucky before European contact. Now we fast forward about 400 years and here in this map we see what Kentucky looks like today. And so again I'd like you to pay attention to the lighter colors in this map, so the beige colors, and that's actually our agricultural and open land. So things where row crop agriculture is happening, uh, we're grazing cattle on these lands, um, we're growing things like corn and soybeans. And so if you kind of use your imagination and compare these two maps, we have about as much open space as we did 400 years ago. 
it's just in a much different um, habitat or vegetative structure than it was back in the day. And so again, the grass, the, the plants that are planted on these open lands now are radically different than the native plants that were planted and existed 600 or 400 years ago. And so along in those open lands over the last 30 or 40 years, the way we farm has really changed. And so here I'm just showing a graph of the average size of a row crop farm in Kentucky through time. And so again, please bear with me with these graphs. We're just looking at the trends, okay? And so as you can see in 1987, all the way to 2017, the average size of our crop farm has increased. And so another thing that has increased along with this is the number of farmers that are working those ground. So right now we have fewer farmers working more ground in the state than we did even 30 years ago. And so here, another graph, I'm showing you how the way we have grazed the land has changed as well. And so this orange line here is the amount of grazing land we have had in Kentucky through time. This blue line is the number of cows we've actually had on that grazing land through time. And so within or starting in the late 1980s and really before this, I'm not showing this on the graph, but we had proportionally more grazing land to the number of cows we had. And so we have decreased the amount of grazing land and the amount of cows we have through time. But a very important thing to note here is we've more quickly decreased the amount of acreage that we're grazing those cows on. So essentially we have more cows on less acres today than we did 30 plus years ago. And some of the issues that could arise from that are things like overgrazing. Um, I'm sure some of the people listening might have been driving down the road and they see a pasture that has maybe too many cows in it and the grass is about one inch tall. Mm -hmm. That grass that is about one inch tall is not the same type or height of grass that a lot of those animals I showed you earlier are accustomed to living in. It's just not their habitat. And here is a one last graph on land use. So here's the number of acres of developed land in Kentucky. And this one kind of blew my socks off when I very first saw it. So now we're actually gonna pay a little bit of attention to our axis here, okay? So this is in thousands of acres, the number, the amount of acreage in Kentucky that is developed. And when we say developed land, we're talking about things that are like parking lots, Walmarts, shopping centers, things along those lines. And so as you can see, starting in 1982, we had a little bit over, you know, on this graph, a thousand, um, I guess it'd be a hundred thousand acres of developed land. And as we move into 2015, we've almost doubled that amount. And so an important metric to take from this graph is this habitat, this ground that was habitat, will likely never be quail habitat again. Whereas the first two slides we were talking about, that open agricultural ground, that could very easily um, be changed just a tiny bit to have a lot more wildlife habitat within it. Okay, and just to drive the point home about what we're talking about here about landscape level change in Kentucky through time. So this is satellite imagery, believe it or not, from 1992. October of 1992. And I'm going to show you another picture that is the same area, so the same location from satellite imagery. I'm going to show you how this landscape has changed in those short, not even 30 years. And so I'll ask you to pay close attention to some things on this satellite image. This image was from 1992. And we can see here, the different colors here likely represent different cropping schemes. So this individual is probably, you know, planting corn or soybeans, maybe has a tobacco crop going, maybe grazing some cattle on this farm. And he even has maybe a field buffer. And so field buffers are really important for the wildlife. And a field buffer is a buffer of habitat that's planted around a row crop agricultural field. So the animals, when a farmer goes in and cuts that crop, the animals can shoot off into that buffer and maybe exist in that cover through the winter and then go back in once the crop grows back up. All right, so this is 1992, and this is 2007, I think. This is 2007. And so we're looking at a big change here, right? And so now everything kind of looks a lot more similar, right? 
everything looks a lot more similar. There's maybe not enough, as many places for wildlife to go when this individual goes and harvests his crop. There was a lot of fence rows or shrubby habitat that a lot of these grassland songbirds, quail definitely included, rely on. And so I think it's worth going back one more time and just watching how this changes. You know, Cody, what jumps out to me is, you know, we'll leave that graph up there from, the, you know, what more current state is. It's hard for any type of critter that's a wild animal to make a living in that, whether you're a deer, a turkey, you know, a, a songbird or a quail. I mean, there's just nowhere to hide. You know, you have habitat in the, in the agriculture in six months of the year in those beans and, and cornfields, but you, know, you take that away during harvest time and you're left with bare dirt and, and nowhere for them to hide for the rest of the year. So, you know, that in and of itself, that whole place is not really even much hardly any wildlife habitat because there's nothing there for them to sustain themselves for food or cover, right? That's exactly right, Gabe. And as Ben very accurately mentioned, you know, habitat is kind of those three things, right? It's food, water, and shelter, you know? And not only is this, could be potentially a food limiting system, but it's really the cover that gets limited in these systems. And that's what we see across the state. You know, and it's not just quail, you know, you hear a lot about, but with deer too, like, oh, there's, there's ag everywhere. Well, it's hard to believe, but deer can starve to death in an ag area just because they don't have something to eat for six months. So, you know, we have to make sure we realize that just because you have agri agriculture on the landscape doesn't mean that it's great habitat and can that animals can survive year round from it. I completely agree. And that's a good point. And that's why I'll go back one more time. We, I mentioned field buffers, but what you're talking about, you know, buffering an individual's crop field is a really good way to circumvent that lack of cover during those six months. And so here's there, the Is there a, um, you were talking about the buffer. I mean, what's an ideal buffer size wise? It depends on the system it's in. I mean, a hundred feet would probably be good, I would say. You know, Kevin and Gabe, I'm going to jump back in here real fast and and kind of chime in. We're, we're talking a lot about habitat and we're talking a lot about large habitats, but it's important for folks to know that you don't have to own a thousand acres, you know, to be able to have quail. Now, the more acres you have, the better, absolutely. And the more quail you're going to have, that's common sense. But, you know, I can give you an example of my own, um, my wife and I, we live on 35 acres and we're surrounded by agriculture, but we decided last year that we wanted to convert some of our fields over to quail, pollinator, songbird habitat. You know, it, it's all, that's another take home message. What we're doing for quail benefits everything, not just quail, but on our small acreage surrounded by agriculture, um, we've got a covey of wild quail that my bird dog flushes just about every day when we go on a walk. So you can have quail on small acreage. It's just all about providing them a place to live that they really don't have much of right now. A good point, Ben. Um, you know, Cody, you've kind of talked about landscape change, habitat, farming practices. You know, we realize that, but what can we do? What, what can the agency do? What can we provide to people? How, how do we move forward in the future? What can we, how can we show success uh, recommendations for, for folks. So what kind of transitioning now, um, what have we done to try to m bring awareness to this and, and set the future a little bit? Yeah, thanks, Gabe. You read my mind. That's exactly where okay. I was going to go next. And so, you know, this was kind of a slow realization for professionals in the field as well. You know, again, we we, the profession, had thought, you know, putting out birds would work. You know, we thought bringing in unique exotic birds would work. And so the habitat question really came into focus, um, again, kind of later on, uh, not, not really that long ago. And so um, in Kentucky, I, I should have mentioned this before, but so I, I'm a small game program biologist. So I did what Ben Robinson did before he was in his current position. And Ben Robinson and... John Morgan. So you, you couldn't talk about quail in Kentucky without mentioning John Morgan. And so Ben and John got together and 
John at this point was a program coordinator uh, for KDFWR and they developed the first Road to Recovery, the blueprint for restoring the Northern Bob White in Kentucky. And so this was in 2008 and this was a 10 year restoration plan. And so within this plan, Ben and John came up with strategies that addressed challenges that sought to address goals, broad, very broad goals um, about how to bring back Bob White in the state. Okay, and so the goal of the plan was to, first of all, get in, have a look at what's happening and see if we can implement some things as a division to try to get the quail population, break it loose from that precipitous decline that we saw on the graph from the rural mail carrier survey. And also they had an ingenious idea to count all those other grassland songbird, all those birds that, you know, we don't hunt, but a lot of people enjoy seeing at their feeders or enjoy going out with a pair of binoculars and, and observing. And so within this first plan, um, a roadmap was laid out for division personnel to follow across the state. And along with the, the initial report, again, this was a 2008, this was in 2008, it was a 10 year plan. They published a five year halftime report. And then we also just recently in 2020 completed the final report. So within this final report, we kind of capstoned all the things that we had done throughout the state. And I will also mention, you know, this whole plan was kind of a stepping down of our one of our NGO partners, the National Bob White Conservation Initiative. And so the National Bob White Conservation Initiative is trying to do a similar thing that I just mentioned that we're doing in Kentucky with the Road to Recovery. They're trying to do this range wide. So all across those states in which Ben showed at the very beginning, um, you know, states like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, all the way up into the Northeast and all the way down to Florida and over to Texas. And so we took the information that they were compiling and kind of stepped it down into Kentucky. Cody, tell us, you know, for our watchers, uh, where they could go find these reports. Is this available to the public? Um, where one might get on and, and review what you've laid out and the kind of the results from that? Yeah, and so we have printed versions of all of these that can be sent via snail mail at request. We also have all of this information available electronically on the website. Simply go to our homepage and type in road to recovery, quail plan, um, keywords like that, and you'll get a PDF version of these plans. Okay, thank you. And again, our website's fw.ky.gov. Real easy to, uh, to find these documents and just uh, read over them. I think all three are available, plus a lot more on, uh, on the quail page. So we're talking 10 years of planning and benchmark reports. Give us the highlight version. Tell us the, you know, the, the, the Cliff Notes version of what you found and what you uh, ex expect and how things work for us. Yeah, and so I'll give you a quick, these are the results, these graphs that I'm showing you here are the results of the 10 year plan. And so again, not necessarily important to know what's on the X and Y axes, just observe the trends. So first of all, uh, for Bob White over those 10 years, we do see Bob White increasing through time on areas in which we focused our management. And so within our plan, we had seven focus areas. And within each one of those focus areas, we tried to apply management that we thought would be beneficial to quail. It actually turned out that the management was also beneficial to a lot of those songbirds, those species we do not hunt for as well. And so most of these graphs look like they're, you know, they're increasing or stabilizing. I'll also say, keep in mind, this is very much in contrast to what was going on in the region at the time. Remember I showed you those first early slides where all of these same birds were declining very quickly. And so within our focus areas, you know, outside of the focus areas, outside of the state, these birds were declining at the same point in time in which we were actually growing these birds on our focus areas. So in, in my review and these plans, what we essentially recommended was the creation of a focal area. You, you kind of refer to that. And that would be efforts that we did where we would take a place and really put a lot of time, effort, and management into to see if we could actually manipulate or increase the population. Is that is that correct, Cody? 
Yes, that's exactly correct. And I'm going to throw this over to Jacob to talk about kind of what we did specifically on our quail focus area. And I'll also ask you to, you know, keep in mind, you know, we're, we're focusing our management on these quail focus areas to try to grow quail. So we're trying to give quail and other songbirds um, the right kind of habitat to exist in. And so when Jacob goes through this, I challenge you to think in your mind, you know, is there any areas of the 35 or 1,000 acres that you own that you could potentially do some of these things on? Well, Jacob, welcome. Um, you know, we introduced you there at the beginning. Glad to have you on. Um, so yeah, talk about quail focal areas. Give us a little bit of background of why we've got you here. You know, we introduced you as our as our private lands coordinator, but previously you were uh, a wildlife management area, worked on a wildlife management area in, in one of these focus areas, correct? Hey, that's correct, Gabe. I worked at Clay WMA that is uh, here on your screen. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen right now, but I can't. But uh, you can see Clay WMA here. Um, I did uh, managed it for the past six years, which actually took in the last half of the 10 year of the quail folk area. And uh, I'm gonna try to show you where the rubber hits the road. I'm trying to get this. There we go. There we go. All right, so the quail, fo quail focus area. This is a good sign here. It's on Clay WMA. Uh, habitat maintained by people. And you see a big quail there. Uh, that's where a whole lot of what I'm getting ready to talk to you about now is where the rubber hits the road. Uh, we've talked about the past trying to introduce birds in, uh, that not working, trying to make a framework of uh, how we're gonna get habitat in. And if we put habitat down, does it work? Will you get populations back? Uh, and I will say, yes, it does work. Uh, we sh that's one thing that the, the road to recovery showed us that in every focal area that we tried to do work on, we actually got stuff done. Um, here on the slide that you are looking at, uh, this is actually open ground management that was done on Clay WMA. Uh, you'll see fire, you'll see uh, crimson clover, winter wheat that we plant and let go fallow. You'll see uh, disc, uh, disc fields, disc breaks. Um, and then you'll see Ben down here, uh, a lot younger, uh, just, uh, <laughs> doing uh, 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 calibrating a drill, plant some native grasses. Uh, so this is just some of the stuff that we do to manage for quail, uh, to put that habitat we we're talking about to provide them what they need to thrive on the landscape. And this is kind of some of the results you get when you do the work. Uh, you'll see in the top corner, this is our annual grains. We plant the annual grains, uh, let it go fallow. And uh, for the next three years, that's prime habitat, brooding cover, um, just good, all around good habitat. You got native grass in the bottom corner. Um, Again, a nice, uh, if managed correctly, it needs to be managed. Uh, it provides the cover and the brooding stuff needed for, uh, for quail. Uh, Jacob, I was, I was gonna say, you know, what sticks out to me is, you know, I see a dove field. I see places for deer to, to feed on. I see, you know, all this other turkey roost habitat. So, you oh. know, a lot of this was done for quail, but you know, hundreds of other species benefit from that game species and non-game species. And you'll, Pollinators. And you'll get a whole, I'll give you, I'll show you a whole lot more information about that here in just a minute, Gabe, on, okay. on exactly why we do this. Um, on Clay WMA, we had a forested landscape with uh, grassland components within it. So part of the emphasis on Clay WMA was to manage the forest make it better that could support quail uh, across the landscape when we could. Uh, so you'll see anywhere from logging to invasive species, to prescribed fire, to mid-store removal. Um, and you get some pretty cool looking stuff. With the, Jacob, with the, with the forest standard improvement projects uh, in, the, in the bottom left there, mm -hmm. the, the thinking there is opening up space and allowing right. allowing the vegetation yeah. to, to yeah. take hold. Right? If you look at the, the slide we got up right now, you'll see some of the results from that. Uh, you go from a dense uh, forest that didn't have much ground cover to places uh, that has cover. Uh, you'll see some uh, rough leaf dogwood and some wild plum down here at the bottom. Uh, you'll see some of the logging stuff, what it looked like afterwards. So this went from a, a forest. Now, 
when we talk about logging, this is something that we do along with a forest management plan with a goal in mind as we move forward. Um, this is not just done uh, willy nilly on, on a whim. Uh, this is planned out forest management. Uh, some of this stuff is uh, stuff for oak management. Some of it is stuff that we need to set back to start over and, and, and manage it as a forest. Uh, so there's all kinds of stuff here, but all this stuff that you're looking at on your screen is good quail habitat that was once a dense forest. Everything's not meant to go this way. It is uh, it's something that needs to be planned and looked at and, and done correctly when done. Um, now I'm going to jump into exactly what you're talking about early, Gabe. Uh, I'm sorry I'm kind of talking quick here, but I'm trying to get the uh, present and the future in pretty quick before we leave here. <laughs> some questions, in. But uh, if you look at the, the map here, you'll see all this orange. That's all the stuff that we manage. This map uh, is actually uh, outdated there. If, if I was to show you what we actually did over the next five years, there'd be a whole lot more orange there. So what I want you to take away from this is, is quail habitat is nothing, is so, not so anything that you can just do and walk away from. It's something that can be pretty intensive. Um, but on, on, a, on a landowner's landscape, we'll talk about this some more in a minute, it's not as uh, cumbersome as what we did at Clay WMA. Um, but so it's nothing to be scared of. It's just something to remember that Management is a constant thing, not a one and done thing. So it's something to think about. And you'll see here, go ahead. I was just gonna say, it really depends upon your goals as the landowner, right? Like That's you, correct. Might, you might wanna have a, put implement a practice and step away. Like it might be some sort of forest, forest procedure or you know, you're working to have pollinator or grouse or not grouse, sorry, but pollinator or quail habitat. So you're gonna be a little more active. So you can kind of pick and choose based upon what you want um, as a landowner. Right. And that's kind of a, you mentioned grouse there for a minute. That's kind of the interesting thing about Clay WMA is there are portions here that you can have quail and flush grouse in a close proximity on the way stuff is laid out on the WMA. You can do some management and it could be quail habitat for five years and grouse habitat for the next 15 years. Gotcha. So it's something that, that depending on where you want to go is where you can go with it. So, um, and the graph here that you showed uh, back here that there was uh, quail was rising. So this is where you jumped into what you're talking about. Good for turkeys, good for quail. If you look here, this is the uh, poults per hen. So reproduction on clay WMAs, the blue going up. Uh, the other one is what we call the central uh, portion of Kentucky. If you compare the two, um, clay WMA is steadily going up and I would say the central is pretty flatlined as far as recruitment. Um, next, deer management, deer harvest on clay. Through the 10 years we've done the project, and I don't have this year's on here, but we had a record harvest at clay this year. Uh, we got over 200 deer killed on, on, the, on the area this year. So those numbers are consistently going up. Uh, and deer, uh, our deer camera surveys were consistently going up. Woodcock, not many people talk about uh, Woodcock, but if you look at the Clay WMA breeding bird ground survey numbers compared to the rest of the Kentucky, it's good Woodcock habitat too in all those same years that we did all the quail work. Uh, you mentioned pollinators. This is a pollinator field. This field right here, if you were to plant it to milkweed and everything else would probably cost you seven, $800 an acre to plant. This was done with simple fire and herbicide. Uh, and if you look, look at uh, all the different milkweeds that came up afterwards, uh, you got green milkweed, you got common milkweed, white milkweed and butterfly milkweed. Uh, and if you see up top there, that's, uh, that is a uh, monarch caterpillar okay. uh, nice. on one of the milkweeds. So if you look at this field, I mean, it's prime pollinator habitat done for quail well with everything else. Uh, good management is, uh, is diverse management. Uh, you know, I always tell people all the time, I, I want my habitat like I want my uh, portfolio on the stock market. I want it diverse. 
That's I mean, diversity is good no matter where you go with it. So that uh, so that's it's a key on on making making your habitat as diverse as possible. See, we've got Cody here. Cody, you want to chime in on some of this stuff, man? Yeah, great points, Jacob. And it's really interesting to see a field like this. Uh, you mentioned, you know, quail habitat work is work that you got to go back in and, and constantly do something in. And this, I think, is you mentioned this, but this is a great example of you kind of went in once and did something. And now you can sit back for a few years and enjoy these native plants that are coming back and the native wildlife that more or less immediately are coming back. Yeah, that's, that's good. Exactly, uh, Cody. Wonderful point. So we've talked about our focal areas. We've talked about, um, you know, our benchmarks reports. Walk us through the future. Walk us through where we think we need to go. You know, you guys are the biologists. You're the professionals know how to manage the species. What can landowners do? Kind of kind of lay the picture for us, if you will, to, to wrap things up into a future forethought, if you will, please. Yeah, thanks, Gabe. So I'll start out and then throw it back over to Jacob. So just to wrap up the quail plan. So again, this is our final report from the 10 year quail plan. And I'm showing this is a part of that rural mail carrier survey, apart from 2008 when we started to 2020 when we ended. So we did all of this focus management on our wildlife, on our quail focus areas. We saw quail increases. However, the statewide indice, this indice here, is still showing a decline in the quail population through those 10 years. So this brings us into the future conversation. So the road to recovery has been completed. That was a 10 year quail plan. We, again, I, I, I hope that any interested people listening to this will go to our website and check it out. There's a lot of great stuff in there. Uh, ben Robinson and John Morgan did a great job laying that out. Now it's up to us to kind of figure out what we're doing moving forward, keeping in mind Okay, so one, we learned we know how to grow quail on our focused habitat areas. And two, we did not affect the statewide quail population. All right, uh, I'm gonna talk about the future real quick. Uh, the future is our private lands. Uh, we've shown, uh, I've sat here and talked about wildlife management areas, which is state owned ground, uh, that we can do whatever we need to do to get where we need to go. Um, so the next step is our private lands, uh, working with private landowners. And that's where I come in. Uh, I don't know if this is a good thing or not, but I guess I'm leading the charge for the future. Um, so we'll see. Uh, check back. You know, it's been three weeks. Uh, so <laughs> another, another, another 10 years we'll go from there. We expect great things already, Jacob. Come on, man. Let's, let's so, make it happen. Yeah. So what you're seeing here is, a, is an example of Kentucky Fish and Wildlife working with uh, producers on their property to manage their property for whatever you want. Not what we want, but what you want. And all those practices I've shown you, there's ways that we can do it on your property. Uh, this is just another picture. Go ahead and click through whoever's clicking there. Uh, your next cash cow could be blue stem. This is, brings us into opportunities for you as a private landowner. Um, Next slide, please. All right, uh, NRCS, uh, Nat National Resource Conservation Service and, and uh, uh, FSA has management programs. Um, I'm gonna run through this real quick again for you. Uh, Environmental Quality Incentive Program. Uh, last year, NRCS has this money to do the practices I talked about earlier on your property. Uh, Kentucky spent in 2019 $1.7 million on wildlife conservation alone in the state of Kentucky. So there's money out there for you. Please, I'm gonna give you some numbers here. Uh, and just a minute at the end, call us, let us come talk to you. Uh, let us try to help you manage and meet your goals. Um, not only can help with production on the, on can production, but also on, um, on wildlife uh, for the two to go together. If you look at this picture right there, right here, this is a good example of a, a, a CRP buffer with crops uh, and this stuff on the edge uh, that's not as productive. Uh, 
you know, through CRP, they'll do a set aside area and you get uh, payments each year for soil rental rates for that. So that's a good example of somebody maximizing uh, the opportunities with farm bill programs uh, on the areas that aren't as productive, but utilizing the areas that are productive to get more out of it. Jacob, well, just just pause for a second. You're kind of throwing around some acronyms, some yeah, programs, yeah, and yeah. lots of money. Let's let's yeah. let's take a step back, if we will. Right. So you're talking about federal programs that the federal government has has put into place for habitat management, proper resource management. Correct. So these are correct. things that we work with with our federal partners as an agency to work with landowners to provide incentive. A you know, financial incentive to, to properly manage their habitat. And that so is, these are the different programs that we have that are, are available to us as Kentuckians that we can enact on our, on our land, correct? That is correct. So not only are there programs out there, we have biologists uh, with the department who can come out and talk to you about these programs and give you advice, just like these gentlemen are doing on these slides, uh, on, on how to to reap the benefits of these programs. Uh, I, I know you're gonna show how to contact us, but you know, the thing that I hear a lot is, well, how much does that cost? But you know, that's the cool thing, right? That our, our staff are available for you for free. We don't charge a thing to come out, talk to your property and walk your property, talk to you about your goals. So it's a, it's a service that we provide as the Department of Fish and Wildlife to meet with you and our landowners, right? That's correct. And, and we welcome the opportunity to talk to you. No matter what you're managing from salamanders to elk in Kentucky, we want to talk to you and we want to help you make your property as good as possible. Uh, Cody showed you a whole lot of slides showing the, the idea behind, uh, you know, urbanization coming in and, and uh, you know, the agriculture stuff. That shouldn't be scary because there's avenues that we can work with agriculture and wildlife. Sometimes they won't work together, but a lot of times we can mix them up so we can get the benefits of both worlds. Uh, so I, I welcome the opportunity to talk to you. There's three names here. Uh, these are our liaison biologists uh, out of each one of these areas. They're all in the NRCS offices. Uh, underneath them, they each have uh, about five people that, uh, that they can get you in contact with to um, have them come out and do a visit with you. We welcome the opportunity um, to talk to you, to let you know what's available. Like I said, again, from, from quail management to, well, you just tell us what you want to manage for in wildlife and we're here to try to help you out with it, so. All right. Source and, and you know, uh, this, you know, our program tonight will be, you know, be replayed here on YouTube. So if you need to, to go back and reference this uh, contact information, uh, you'll be able to, it's also available on the department's website. So Jacob, great job. Yep, yep, thank you, Jacob. Let's bring on the panel and let's, uh, let's try to get to some questions so our folks that are watching, you know, type in those questions, if you will, and uh, we'll kind of jump right into some of these things. And I'm just gonna lob them out and anybody who wants to uh, take some of these, uh, we'll have at it. So. Uh, first one I see here, what kind of food plot or other improvements can we do that benefit quail and other game? I think we've talked about that. Anything you guys would like to discuss on that further? Uh, personally, the food plot aspect, uh, the benefit is there for food plots, a winter wheat, a milo, anything like that. But your real benefit to a food plot is the fallow. Once you leave it fallow for the next two or three years, uh, that's, that's the, the benefit of a food plot for quail. In my eyes, I'll let anybody else chime in if they see something different. I think you've got that pretty good, Jake. Uh, one question here, when we talked about back, you know, 100 years ago and the agency moving quail, the agency propagating and growing and releasing them, you know, why aren't we doing that um, now while we're taking birds and then moving them into good habitat as an agency? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a great question, Gabe. And there is a little bit of this going on. Some of the southern states and some of the, you know, the southern universities who really research quail pretty hard, or they're starting to look into this. Um, the short answer for Kentucky, um, unfortunately, we don't really have enough birds to move. You know, we don't have areas with large enough populations that we're comfortable uh, 
going and trapping those and moving them to areas. Not saying that it wouldn't work, but we would need some pretty robust pop, you know, populations to be able to, to actually go out and trap and move them around. I know for me in, in quail and small games, I, when you start talking about that, immediately what comes up in my mind and I hear people say is, well, what about the predators? What about the, you know, the hawks, the coyotes, the foxes? Um, how can a quail population withstand that with, you know, some populations of those predators increasing? Um, and what do we do to try to combat that? Yeah, that's a great point, Gabe, and, and one that often comes up with my interactions with sports people. And there's, there's no doubt about it, predators are likely playing some role um, in this equation. I will say, though, as I tried to develop in, in a couple of those slides I showed, we're losing habitat and we believe that that is, that is the ultimate issue. That's probably the number one issue. There's a lot of issues downstream of that, and we know that um, predators is, is one of them. If you give quail enough of that cover, a part of their habitat that they need, enough of that woody cover, the real nasty brambles and stuff, um, they will have an escape route to get away from a lot of the predators. So one thing you know I like to think about or, or tell myself is a healthy adult quail if you've been lucky enough to see one or been in the middle of a covey rise, you know, those animals are very evasive and a healthy adult quail should be able to get away from, from most of those predators that you mentioned, just as long as we give them the habitat that they have grown accustomed to over time. So you mentioned habitat and I think it segues very nicely into our next question where, you know, you know, so much of the way we like our farms, the way we like our property is clean and manicured you know, pristine, and we see that blue bluegrass that we're known for in this state, you know, how much do I need to let that go fallow? I don't want it to grow up and become woody. I want it to become early successional. So what does that look like in practice? You know, I want to have some of that green space, but also I want to provide habitat. What, any recommendations on, on that from, from the panel? Yeah, I'll jump in here and hopefully others will too. The one thing I like to tell people or like to think about is when you're going to bush hog or you have your bush hog out in the shed and you want to use it, think about why you're using it. You know, are you using it just to manicure your space? That's, that's a no, no for wildlife. Okay. And I, under, I totally understand the want to make that happen, but if we can let these areas grow up into at least marginal habitat or habitat, they can at least exist in for parts of the year, then we're doing wildlife in general, a great service. And so, you know, you're probably going to need to get in there. If all you have is a bush hog, you're not able to burn or spray herbicide, you know, probably once every three years or once a year at most bush hog, again, for an objective. So you're only bush hogging to keep the trees out or to keep the, the large woody stems out of your, out of your acreage and not to slick it down to the ground and manicure it. Any other thoughts, guys, on kind of what you would do or practice that you implement on the WMA or on your properties that you like to do? Uh, you know, if I'm coming up to a piece of property, you know, this is all different based on how it lays, what it is. But if, if you can get good corridors, you know, of 10 to 15 percent of your farm that has, you know, uh, some type of like uh, what we call good habitat. So basically uh, something that's grown up a little bit, a little brushy. Uh, and it, it doesn't hurt if you, if you mow it and, uh, and but mow it in sections every two to three years, uh, disking it prolongs the idea behind the trees not coming back in, planting some like the winter wheat and the food plots, that kind of stuff. Uh, doing that kind of stuff uh, length, lengthens the time the trees coming back in there. Uh, but, you know, really, and that's where it comes down to is, is depending on what piece of property you have and how it lays, you might be able to get away with 10%. You might have to do 50%, depending on the, the what's around you. And that's why, like I said, come talk to us. Let us come look at it, and we'll, we'll give you some good advice on, on what you need to do. You know, Gabe, along those lines, I think, folks really just need to ease into this. You know, the kind of the culture of having a grown up messy farm with weeds is gone. You know, folks are used to seeing more manicured properties and they're not comfortable with, with weeds. It, some folks 
you know, it gives the impression that you're lazy and you're, that you're not doing any management. So maybe start with a compromise. If you've got road frontage, you know, mow that off, make it look nice, go to the back of your property and start there and then have conversations with your neighbors about what you're doing and what you're trying to achieve. You know, say, I'm not, I'm not lazy. I'm not just, you know, deciding not to mow. I'm doing this for a reason and, uh, and kind of build that culture back up. You know, go ahead, Kevin. And maybe you're, you know, you talk about, you know, talking to your neighbors about that, but maybe those neighbors would be like, Hey, you know, I'm in too, you know, let's, uh, you know, let's, uh, let's build on this and see where it goes. Absolutely. You start showing them uh, some trail cams of some, uh, you know, some big bucks coming through your property and whatnot. And, uh, and, and that might help entice them a little bit too, you know. You know, we talked about property size and how it, that's changing over time. You know, as we have, you know, recreational landowners, I might not have a tractor. I might not have a big brush hog. Is there something that I can do? You know, we saw some photos of fire, some, you know, more mechanical I mean, do you have to have a tractor and big equipment to do this, or can you do this with a little bit of hand tools and some, uh, some sprayers? You know, what, what do you need to pull off habitat management for quail? Yeah, that's I'll jump in and take that one, Gabe, because I'm a I'm a living example of this. You know, I I don't have big equipment on my acreage. Um, I do a lot of it with sweat equity, and you know, I get out there with a lot of hand tools, four wheelers and, and sprayers and backpack sprayers and things like that. Um, Obviously, the larger acreage you're trying to manage, yeah, you probably are going to start to need to get a little more mechanized. But uh, when you're starting small, you can certainly do it with uh, with a limited amount of equipment. And if you start learning how to use prescribed fire and get comfortable with that, uh, you can manage large acreages really easily without with very little equipment. So, yeah, that's a great point, Ben. I might jump in and, and echo that point as well and mention, you know in the times in which we think there were great quail numbers, you know, it was actually a lack of mechanization, you know, it was a lack of people owning bush hogs that really led to that. You know, our program was called Farm Game and it was kind of, we were a byproduct, small game was a byproduct of the way people farmed. And it was kind of a, Gabe, to get to your point, it was more or less in some instances, a lack of having equipment that led to a lot of these brushy areas and a lot of marginal habitat for not only quail, but all those songbirds and the deer and, and things along those lines. Well, guys, I think we're, we've covered a lot of ground, plowed a lot of ground, had some great topics, answered some good questions. Um, so I thank you guys. Thank you very much for your expertise. Thank you for what you do for the sportsmen, sportsmen and women of Kentucky. You know, this, this episode is here. Uh, for people to go back and review, but also we want to make sure that people are aware that we are here for you. Our resources, our expertise is here. Jacob covered that very well. So, you know, to plug that again, go to our website at fw.ky.gov and you can search quail, you can search private lands. There's also a, a feature where you could also find, find my county contact and search by where you are as far as the county goes. And it will tell you all the different professionals who work in your county and their, their expertise. So, Ben, Cody, Jacob, thank you. Thank you for what you do. It's a pleasure having you on tonight. Thank you, Gabe. Thank you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, guys. Enjoyed it. Uh, enjoyed it a lot. We could. We went a little bit over, um, but it's easy to do. I mean, we right. are really covering. I mean, um, you know, we, we started back in the early 1900s tonight, and uh, wrapping up. Uh, you know, looking at uh, looking at the future. So. Uh, Great stuff all around. Um, again, appreciate uh, Cody, Ben, and, and Jacob. Um, I was I was hoping to uh, to challenge them to see who had the best Bob White whistle, but we we uh, we did not do that tonight. Gabe, uh, Gabe, you want to try? No, man, kidding. no, that's not for me. So, <laughs> you know, we'll we'll kind of you know something we didn't really talk about much today in, in our conversation was hunting. You know, we, we kind of yeah. talked about the habitat side of things and what you need to have quail, but. We still have quail. They're thriving in places and quail season is in right now. So, you know, for our quail enthusiasts, you have still an opportunity to hunt quail. That season runs through the end of this Sunday. If you're in the Eastern zone for our watchers in the Western zone, that season goes out February the 10th. Um, you, know, you know, also we talk about if you have any additional questions, please call us. We have fantastic resources of professionals that can answer your questions and walk you through that. You can visit our website or you can call our information center at 1-800-858-1549. If you're close to Frankfurt also, and you're interested or want to make a trip to Frankfurt, 
come to our Salado Wildlife Education Center. Um, it's closed for, for the season right now, but it will be opening in the spring. We have a very large quail exhibit. We actually have some live quail, so you can go in and see habitat practices, what they look like, kind of review of some of those things. And uh, just a great way to, to learn more about quail and the, the interesting game bird that it is. So, you know, the way I like to close this on is pass on your hunting and fishing tradition, take someone hunting or fishing this year. What a great opportunity as we segue and get closer to spring. It's hard to think about, you know, snow on the ground right now, but spring is right around the corner. Well, it is. So we'll be, uh, we've got uh, more installments of uh, conservation conversations uh, coming up uh, next month. Uh, so uh, this first month, our theme was uh, uh, restoration efforts. And uh, next month, uh, we're going to uh, look at a theme of threats facing fish and wildlife. So um, look for that uh, coming up. And to those uh, watching tonight, uh, we hope you enjoyed it. I uh, hope you learned um, something. I sure did. Um, I always learn something when I talk to, to Jacob, Ben, and Cody. Um, and I just want to thank you all for, for tuning in, uh, for asking the questions. We really value, you know, getting the questions for you, from you and hoping to get the answers, um, you know, in, in as close to real time as possible. So if you like what you saw, uh, go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button at the top right corner of the YouTube page, then select the bell. And uh, for all notifications and new content from uh, Kentucky Fish and Wildlife. And Gabe, were you gonna share that screen? Yeah, I believe that, that I did, but just so- All right, more. good deal. Okay. I didn't want to. I didn't want to wrap things up before we showed everybody how to hit the subscribe button there. So uh, we'll be back uh, two weeks from tonight and for our next uh, installment of Conservation Conversations. Uh, we'll discuss the uh, threats related to conservation or fish and wildlife in uh, in Kentucky. And uh, want to thank you again. Wish you a good night. Have a good weekend. Thank you. See you, Kevin. See you, Gabe.